Today on America's Test Kitchen, Keith makes Bridget the perfect Tuscan grilled pork ribs. Adam reveals his top pick for honing rods. Dan reveals the science behind oily mushrooms. And Lon makes Julia the ultimate sauteed mushrooms with red wine. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Tuscan cooking is all about restraint and elegance. Take, for example, rosticiana, which is grilled pork ribs. Now, any flavors or seasonings are sparingly applied to the meat so that the flavor of the pork and fire comes through. Now, Keith's here, and he's going to show us how to make this elegant Tuscan dish at home. Yeah, so these ribs are unlike what most people think of barbecue ribs. They're not fall off the bone. There's no smoke. There's no spice rub. There's no sticky sweet glaze. It's all about the pork. They're cooked over a fairly high heat, so they're going to get nice and brown. They're going to get nice and roasty, and they're going to have the succulent flavor and a little bit of chew. We're starting with St. Louis style spare ribs. These are coming from the rib of the pig, you know, down by the belly. They're about two and a half to three pounds each. Unlike with American barbecue, where you grill the whole rib really slowly, most of these recipes are grilling individual ribs, so you get a lot more brown and you have a lot more surface area. But you can imagine trying to juggle 20 ribs on a hot grill with a lot of fat, not fun. And you so might lose a few of them. You're going to lose a few, <laughs> you're going to have flare-ups, it's going to be a mess. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two rib portions here. So we're going to maximize the surface area, but we're going to reduce those things that we're trying to tend on the grill okay. by half. I like to flip it over so I can actually see the ribs. Makes it's sense. much easier to see. I'm just going to cut right in between them. Very simple. And we're doing two ribs. Do the same thing here. Some ribs have 12 bones, some have 13. If you get down to the end and you have three bones like I have here, just leave that as a three bone segment. So I'm just gonna uh, pat this dry really quickly with some paper towels. There's usually no adornment with these ribs. We're just gonna use salt and pepper. I'm gonna salt these ribs on both sides with two teaspoons of kosher salt. And we're gonna let that stand for an hour to let that salt penetrate into those muscle fibers, help them retain some juiciness, and also help to season it. Okay, so our ribs have been sitting with that salt for about an hour, and we're about ready to grill, but roasted chiana is usually part of a mixed grill. You have ribs, you have sausage, you have white beans, you have potatoes, it's part of a meal. Mm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some radicchio. I have three 10 ounce heads of radicchio that we're gonna quarter, and we're gonna take those out to the grill with our ribs, and once the ribs are done on the grill, we're gonna grill these really quickly. I really like radicchio on the grill is because it is a little bitter, but on the grill, it caramelizes, takes away some of that bitter edge. Sure does. Okay, and to make sure that these caramelize and don't stick to the grill, we have a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil here that I'm just gonna brush over the top. I wanna get that oil down in between those leaves. Mm. Okay, I'm just gonna season these with salt and pepper, a little kosher salt, and a little bit of pepper. Okay, so our radicchio is ready. Now we just have one more thing to do with our ribs. Again, we're gonna brush these with one tablespoon of vegetable oil. We're only gonna brush the top side of this, what I would call the meat side. The bone side is curved, so it's not gonna really make that much contact okay. with the grill, so we don't need oil there because it won't stick. And one teaspoon of pepper that we're gonna sprinkle okay. over the top as well. Now we're ready to grill. All right. You ready to cook some ribs? So ready. Okay, so our grill is ready to go. I've had this preheated on high heat for 15 minutes. It's gonna be nice and hot. Okay. But I just wanna cut down our heat just a little bit, down to medium high. We don't wanna to go too, too high here. So before we put our ribs on, I just want to give this a quick scrape. One more step. I'm just gonna take some vegetable oil and a towel. I'm just gonna give this a quick rub down with some oil. So now for our ribs, I'm gonna put these on meat side down first. Okay, so meat side down, bone side up, got it. We're gonna let these go for about four minutes and they're gonna get some grill marks on it, just really light browning. We don't wanna get all the browning right now. We just okay. wanna kind of cook them through, you know, medium slow. All right. Okay, so it's been about four minutes. We're gonna give our ribs that first turn. Ah, there's a little color. Yeah, that's perfect. We don't want a lot of color right now. We just want a little bit of color because we're going to get more color on this side gotcha. on the third flip. So I'm just going to give these a quick turn. It's also good at this point, if you have, you know, your cooler part of the grill in the front, you can always move things from front to back, left to right. You kind of feel how your grill works. So I'm just going to take these that are probably getting a little bit more heat, just put them in front like you this. Switcheroonie. 
So we're gonna go another four to six minutes on this side until they're starting to get brown on that bone side of the okay. ribs. Okay, so it's been an, another four minutes and that second side should be nicely browned. Let's look. Oh yeah. Yeah, and you can see that because of the way that rib is shaped, it's not gonna get even brown sure. over the whole thing, but you can see the edges have gotten nicely brown. Beautiful. So I'm just gonna give these one more flip. Okay. And this is our last flip and we're gonna finish cooking on this side. So now it's meat side down again. Now it's meat side down again. We're gonna cook that four to six minutes on that meat side and it's gonna be nice and golden brown and it's gonna be about 175, 185 degrees. So it's been about four minutes and time to check our ribs. It smells amazing. Now what we're looking for is we want some nice deep golden brown oh, coloring on that. Beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? It's like the best roast pork you can imagine. Yes. I just want to check the temperature of these. Now we're looking for about 175 to 180 degrees. That, the collagen will have broken down a little bit, but they're still going to have that nice chewy texture that we're looking gotcha. for. When I tempt these, I can grab it with the tongs. And the nice thing about having these in a two bone section is that you can stick the thermometer in the meat in between those bones. So 182 degrees. So I just put these on here. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can put that down. Gorgeous. Now we're gonna let that rest for about 10 minutes like that before we okay. eat it. We're gonna use that 10 minutes wisely. We still have a hot grill. So we're gonna grill some radicchio. So we're gonna put these on here. If you have some leaves like that, you're better off just to leave them off. They're just gonna burn really quickly. That's gonna cook through pretty quickly, just uh, about five minutes. And we're gonna turn it every one and a half minutes and we're gonna get those three sides. So the two cut side and the round side of that radicchio. Okay. It's been about five minutes. We can check our radicchio now. Mm. Uh, that's looking great. So what we're looking for is we want the outsides of the radicchio to char, but we want the inside to kind of stay nice and pink and still have a little bit of crispness to it. Oh, wow, yeah, a little rosy color inside. Nice little rosy color inside, but it's charred on the outside. That's perfect. We're gonna go inside, we're gonna make a nice sauce for these ribs and then we'll be ready to eat. Okay, the ribs have rested for 10 minutes. We have a couple last minute embellishments for our radicchio first. I just have some balsamic vinegar here. I'm gonna just give a little sprinkle to these. Mm, it's all they need. Yes, the acidic vinegar is gonna balance out the bitterness of that radicchio a little bit. If you have a nice aged balsamic, nice and syrupy, that would be the time to break it okay. out for this. Now for the ribs, we're gonna make a quick vinaigrette. So we're starting with a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. I'm gonna add two cloves of minced garlic and one teaspoon of minced rosemary. And I'm just gonna stir that in here. But that's gonna be kind of harsh right now. So once we get this stirred in, I'm just gonna microwave this for 30 seconds just to take the raw edge off that garlic. Oh, that smells great. It sure does. So it's been 30 seconds. Now I'm just gonna add so two tablespoons of lemon juice. Okay, so our vinaigrette's done and now we can cut our ribs. Again, I flip it over so I can see those bones and cut these in half in between that bone section. Oh, uh, look beautiful. at that. Juicy. Juicy. You never see juicy ribs like that with regular barbecue ribs. Never. The wedge of radicchio. Beautiful. I'm gonna drizzle these with our garlic vinaigrettes. Ugh, that is stunning. The meat is beautifully cooked, nice and juicy. Meat that's cooked right on the bone is so good. Tender and meaty and porky. And so succulent. Mm -hmm. It really is. Even though it's not falling off the rib, it's still really tender. I mean, it's got a little bit of tug and chew, but it's not tough at all. There are only a handful of ingredients here, but it's all about the ribs. It's all about that pork flavor. Let's try the radicchio. Yes. It gets that really nice papery kind of leaves on it. Mm. But it still has a nice crispness on the inside. That's perfect. I mean, radicchio can be very, very bitter, but grilling kind of is magic. Yeah, it mellows it out. The balsamic gives it another edge. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Keith. You're welcome. All right, if you'd like to make rosticciana at home, well, it starts with spare ribs. Cut St. Louis spare ribs into two rib portions, rub the ribs with salt, and then let them rest for an hour. In the meantime, you can oil and season quartered heads of radicchio. Now, go outside and grill the ribs until deeply brown and then grill the radicchio. Drizzle the radicchio with balsamic and create a garlicky rosemary vinaigrette for those ribs. So from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, Tuscan grilled pork ribs and grilled radicchio, AKA rosticciana, AKA gorgeous.
We've all seen chefs take their knives, hold them up in the air, and scrape them against a sharpening steel before getting to work. But the question for Adam today is, does this really do anything? Put that knife down, Julie. You're scaring <laughs> me with that thing. Before we talk about whether it does anything, let's define a couple of terms. Because yes. there's confusion about what sharpening is versus what honing is. Mm -hmm. What happens when you use a knife is that that very point where the two sides meet that's supposed to be the cutting edge, mm -hmm. it will get damaged, it'll get wavy, it'll get bent over, kind of like that. That's called a burr when it's J-shaped. When you hone, you want to realign that burr, straighten it out. You're not removing as much metal as when you're sharpening, but it's going to make the knife feel a little bit sharper, and it's going to extend the time period between actual sharpening, regrinding that cutting edge. And that's valuable. That is valuable. So we wanted to find out about honing rods. However, there's confusion there too. There's nomenclature differences. We have nine different models in our lineup, but they were sold as honing rods, steels, and sharpening rods. <laughs> <laughs> They're all meant to hone the blade. The price range was 15 to about $50. They come in different materials. These two are ceramic. Mm -hmm. The other ones are steel. They also come in different textures. Some of them are fairly smooth, like that ceramic one. Oh, yeah. The steel ones can have ridges in yep. them. Yep, I'm used to that one. Yeah. Some of the steel ones are even diamond coated. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like that one. And some of them have two textures instead of just one, like this one. It's got a smooth side. Oh, yeah. And it's got a slightly ridged side. Huh. Now, just like you showed at the top of this segment, a lot of people, <laughs> chefs, home cooks, hold the hone in one hand, hold yep. the knife in the other. You have two moving parts. The angle is not consistent. We here like to do it a different way. Mm. I'm going to ask you to show me. You I know, know what this. to do. Yep. You use a towel and you put it flat on the counter and then you put the tip of the rod right in the center of the towel. So now you just have one moving part and you can more accurately get that 15 degree angle. And you start at the base and you drag it towards you with an even pressure from tip to tail. On both sides. On both sides. And you work the knife down the steel as you go. Perfect. Perfect. So let me tell you how we tested these. Every hone was assigned its own knife that we dulled with strikes against a glass cutting board. Glass Oof. is really hard, it's horrible to cut on, and it's notorious for dulling a cutting edge. And every couple of swipes down the hone, testers would stop and use the knife to slice paper, which is our standard sharpness test, and yep. also cut fresh tomatoes, just to judge, sort of evaluate the sharpness, see if there was any improvement. We also took all of the hones and all of the knives that were honed on them to be examined under a high-powered microscope at MIT in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering, and that taught Very us a lot. Very cool. So the good news is that honing really does make a difference. All the knives felt a little sharper after they were honed. However, there were differences. The microscope at MIT revealed that the knives that were sharpened on a diamond-coated mm -hmm. steel looked a little scratched, a little rougher, but they still cut through the paper just fine. Interesting. Testers preferred a smoother surface that polishes the cutting edge rather than really rips it up. And what they liked even more were some of these had the dual surface so that you have a slightly rougher surface mm -hmm. to take a little more metal off and give you a little more aggressive honing. And then you can polish it on the smoother surface just by turning the rod 90 degrees and running it down the other side. Very cool. In terms of using the different models, testers really preferred those that had a longer rod Mm -hmm. About 12 inches was the longest one, just because it was a lot easier to get the full stroke from the heel to the tip of the blade. You can see from the handles, they all flare a little bit at the base yep. where it meets the rod. Some of them flare more, some flare less. Testers preferred those that flared less because they just felt like the more dramatic flare could get in the way of the stroke. So in the end, the one that they liked the best was this one. This is the Bob Kramer Double Cut Sharpening Steel. It's about $48. It's got a long 12-inch rod. It's got two textures, smooth and a little bit rougher. It was really a great sharpening hone. If you want to spend a little bit less money, there was a Best Buy. This is the Idaho 12-inch Fine Ceramic Sharpening Rod. It's about $35. Nice, smooth texture. Gave a really good polished edge. So there you have it. Our favorite is the Bob Kramer Double Cut Sharpening Steel for $48. And our runner-up, the Best Buy, is the Idaho 12-inch Fine Ceramic Sharpening Rod for $35.
here's what usually happens when you try to saute mushrooms. You start cooking the mushrooms in a tablespoon of oil in a skillet. You stir a few times and before you know it, all the oil is gone. So you add a little more oil. And you stir some more. And once again, the oil is gone. So you add a little more oil. And you stir some more. And once again, the oil is gone. So this keeps happening over and over until you've added so much oil that you may as well have just deep fried the mushrooms. Raw mushrooms are able to absorb loads of oil because they're packed with air pockets, like a sponge. Check this out. I soaked an equal amount of mushrooms in the same amount of oil for five minutes. This batch here was raw. This batch I cooked briefly in the microwave before adding the oil. The raw mushrooms absorbed all but one tablespoon of the oil. The cooked mushrooms, on the other hand, barely absorbed any oil at all. Just look at the dramatic difference. By cooking the mushrooms first before introducing oil, we can collapse those air pockets so that when oil is introduced, it has nowhere to go. That's how you make great sauteed mushrooms without drowning them in oil. Mushroom sales are hot, and last year they reached an all-time high, bringing in over $1.2 billion. Now, helping to boost sales are the wide varieties you can now find everywhere, from portobellos and carminis to oysters and maitakis. But the question now is for Lon, what's the best way to cook them? So before we get to the best way, here's what not to do. Okay. You don't take beautifully foraged maitakis, uh, hedgehogs, and white Ooh. beach mushrooms, throw them in a screaming hot pan, and kind of hope <laughs> that you get some color and that they're not a greasy mess. So here's what you should be doing. All right. I've got a pound and a quarter of mushrooms here, three different types. Mm -hmm. I've got some white button mushrooms, and these are really easy. I'm just gonna trim the bottom off. And you're leaving the stem on. Yes, they're great. I'm gonna quarter these because they're a little bit large, and if they were a little smaller, I would have them. Because you want them to be the same size so they cook at the same rate. Yeah, these guys are gonna shrink down to about half their size, so I'm shooting for one to one and a quarter inch pieces. Okay. These are oyster mushrooms, and they're fantastic. They're really easy to prep as well. I'm just gonna cut them off the stem. Because that stem is really hard and it won't soften during cooking. Right, and then we're just gonna separate any of the larger pieces. I'm just gonna tear in half. So here we're looking for one to one and a half inch pieces. And all these mushrooms have been washed already. Right, you don't have to worry about them sucking up water. Last up I have shiitakes. Again, I'm just stemming them and you just grab the stem and pop them off. Mm -hmm. Again, those stems won't soften. Right, and the smaller ones I'm gonna have and this larger one I'm gonna quarter. And with all of these mushrooms, I'm just looking for flat edges because they're gonna make contact with the pan and they'll brown. All right, you ready to start cooking? Yes. I am going to dump these in a cold pan. Well, that's the opposite of a screaming hot skillet. So the best way to get browning, you're telling me, is to start in a cold pan and to crowd it. Yes. Okay, and, breaking and all the rules, Lon. Don't forget, add a quarter cup of water. Water? Yes. <laughs> you really are breaking all the rules. Uh, so I'm just gonna crank this up to high and push this around a little bit. The reason I'm doing all of this is mushrooms are full of little pockets and those pockets will suck up oil. That's why whenever you add oil to mushrooms, all that oil disappears. Like sponges. Right, so as we're driving off that water, they're gonna collapse, those little pockets are gonna go away and then they can't suck up the oil. You'll see in just a couple minutes, all the juices that were in the mushroom, they're gonna be on that pan. So Julia, you can see that this is pretty juicy and the mushrooms have also collapsed into almost a single layer, which is exactly what we're looking for. I'm gonna let these keep going until this pan is almost dry. This is gonna take a total of four to eight minutes. It kinda depends on the mushrooms and how wet they are. So it's been about seven minutes and as you can see, there's no water left in this pan. Oh, no, it's dry. Yeah, so it's time to add the oil and start browning. Okay. Um, I have half a teaspoon of oil and it's plenty of oil because the mushrooms aren't gonna suck the oil up anymore. It just needs to coat the mushrooms. Okay. I'm also gonna turn the heat down to medium high. It's gonna take 48 minutes and we're gonna let these guys brown. So these look great. You can see the color on these guys. They're beautiful and I think we're ready to move on. So I'm just gonna push them. You clear the center of the skillet so you can add more ingredients. Yes, and we're adding one tablespoon of unsalted butter. There's the fat. I needed some. <laughs> so you skimped on the oil so you could add extra butter. That's the way to do it. I'm also gonna turn the heat down to medium. 
Now that the butter is melted, I'm adding one shallot that's been minced. This is one teaspoon of fresh rosemary, quarter teaspoon of table salt, and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. I'm just gonna stir this around, let those shallots cook by themselves for a second. So it's been 30 seconds, and you can see these shallots have softened nicely. So I'm adding a quarter cup of a dry red wine here, and you want something that isn't too strongly oaked because those flavors are gonna concentrate and that gets a little heavy. And I've also got a tablespoon of cider vinegar. It Ooh. kind of brightens it and sweetens it a little bit. So this is rosemary shallot and red wine, but you could do other things too. Oh, for sure. I tried a bunch of different flavor combinations. It's a really versatile method. You can find those other variations on our website. It's been a couple minutes and you can see the pan is dry again. Mm. I'm going to add the last ingredient and it's a third of a cup of chicken broth. I want the mushrooms to be lightly coated in just a little sauce. And the simmering you see here is actually really great. It emulsifies the fat into the liquid so that it doesn't eat greasy. So I want this to reduce by half. It's going to take two to three minutes. This looks pretty great. It needs a little bit of salt and pepper. You ready for this? I am. I know you like mushrooms, I right? I love mushrooms. Oh, the smell of the shallots and the rosemary and the butter. <laughs> I actually smell the butter. Yum. Mmm. Aren't they great? It's the texture of the mushrooms. They're perfection, not spongy, not rubbery, just meaty and toothsome. Yeah, I've actually served these to people who don't like mushrooms <laughs> and changed their minds. I believe it. And the flavor of the rosemary and the shallot and the red wine. That rosemary is fragrant, but not overpowering. Mm -hmm. Well done, Lon, these are great. Thank you. And there you have it. The key to perfectly cooked mushrooms is to cram them into a 12 inch nonstick skillet, add water, and let them wilt. Once the excess moisture has evaporated, just add a tiny amount of oil to help them brown. For a final hit of flavor, add some butter and a few aromatics, then some chicken broth so that it cooks down to a luscious glaze. And there you have it, from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a terrific new recipe for sauteed mushrooms with red wine and rosemary. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com. Delicious. Oh, thank you. Mm. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.